And good morning, church. Good morning. Wanted to share with you uh, an update. Um, we've spoken um, over the last couple of weeks, and, and last week I had shared with you that there was going to be uh, a memorial for Sandra Grandal coming, and we were sort of working out those details. Uh, that will be April 24th. Uh, that is a Saturday at 1 p.m. for her church family. Um, it is entirely possible that there will be a second later that day uh, for some extended friends and family. Sandra knew a lot of people, and so, of course, we want to make sure that we were spreading everyone out in a safe and uh, responsible manner, and so we will be having that later in the day. Um, follow up with me. If, if for some reason you can't make the 1 p.m. Uh, memorial and you do want to be a part of that, please just let me know, and we'll, we'll make sure that we can... Um, kind of fits you in in the second one. That shouldn't be a problem. But we will be honoring her uh, at that time. So again, the 24th at 1 p.m. I um, want to encourage you to be there just to, uh, just to celebrate a life well lived. Amen? Amen? Well, we have come here today to give glory to God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Spirit who sustains us. Amen. And to that end, let us join together in prayer, asking God to bless the time that we have here. Would you join me? at this time. Heavenly Father, we come to you again today, Lord, just to bring you glory. And Lord, we pray that you would just prepare our hearts for that purpose as we sing um, in our hearts here in, in a, just a moment and as we hear these words uh, being spoken and being sung. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, use them to speak to us, to give us new insight and revelation. Lord, we pray that um, they would prepare our hearts for worship and Lord we pray that you have prepared our hearts beforehand Lord we ask that your Holy Spirit uh, prepare us for the work that you are going to do uh, prepare our hearts to receive what you have for us here at this time and to be changed Lord I pray that every time we gather here together we do so with an expectation of change Lord if we ever come in these doors and and hear your word and leave and are not convicted in some way shape or form or not moved to uh, leave differently than the way we came or to uh, walk away from the cross the same way we came to the cross. Lord, I pray that you would convict our hearts. We ask at this time, uh, Lord, that you again would just bless us, be here with us, be glorified in us. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. Our call to worship today is Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Amen. Look inside the mystery, see the empty cross, see the risen Savior, victorious as the robber, no one else above him, none as strong to save, he alone has conquered the power of the grave. Gloria, my eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. Gloria, he stands
Amen. Thank you, praise team. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and make your way to the book of Acts, chapter 18. We're going to continue our study in that book. We have been there for some time, and we will be there for some time yet to come. And I hope you've enjoyed the journey thus far. Um, I know I certainly have. Tonight, or today rather, not tonight. It's not going to go that long, I promise. Um, Today we're going to talk about a couple of things. And one central theme that we see throughout this passage is that the, the idea of Things having a time and a season. There is a time and a place for all things in our life. And so as we look through this uh, particular passage, I want us to remember that. To know that not all things happen at all times, and we're not always running at uh, full blast or on all cylinders. There are going to be times in which we need to stop for a moment. And there's a good purpose for that. There's a good opportunity to grow in that before we step into the Word, um, we're going to cover a little bit of ground today, so let's, let's ask the Lord to bless our time here together, as we always do. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we ask again, as we always do, uh, that your Holy Spirit would be our interpreter here at this time, that you would give us new insight and wisdom. Uh, Lord, we want to know you better. We want to love you better. We want to serve you better. And so we pray that you would speak to us today through your Word. Oh, Lord, we know that your Word is true. It rings eternal. Lord, but we know that Uh, The application therein from time to time, uh, Lord, it does change. The world looks different now than it did uh, when these words were first written. And so uh, we pray that you help us to understand how we can apply this in our lives here and now. The principles remain true, and so we cling to those. We we ask that you reveal your wisdom. And uh, Lord, again, as always, we ask that you are honored and glorified. And we ask all of these things, praying in the way that you have taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, again, as I said, if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 18. We are now in Corinth. We are in the next step in Paul's missionary journey. Corinth was an interesting city. Uh, We often hear about things being Corinthian, and I think it's important that we understand what it meant to be a Corinthian, or what that expression meant. Um, It was not a kind expression. Corinth had a bit of a reputation for I hate to make the comparison, but almost being sort of the Las Vegas uh, at the time, right? Um, Kind of the sin city, if you will. And to be a Corinthian uh, was was not seen in a very good light. And so Paul makes his way to Corinth. And let's take a look. Let's begin with uh, verse 1. We're going to kind of stop along the way multiple times. And uh, if we just begin chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila and a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had recommended all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now we see here at the very beginning um, that Paul kind of continues this pattern. We've seen at every stop that he makes, he always kind of first uh, goes to the, the Jews or goes to the synagogue every time he lands at a new place. And we see the same kind of thing. You know, his ministry, even though he was a, it's called to be a witness to the Gentiles, he always made it a point to reach out to the Jews first. And we see him continuing that. We see here a, a statement that you may not have picked up on before. Um, I remember the first time I, I saw this and it kind of threw me back a little bit. Where Paul mentions, or where it is mentioned here, that Paul was of the same trade. Now, we, most of all of us are probably familiar with Paul's tent making days. And, you know, if you were anything like me, at times in your life you just sort of assumed that's a thing he did for a time. But what this text here tells us is that he was of the same trade. Paul was actually a trained tent maker. And, and this seems kind of odd knowing what we know about Paul. Uh, Paul was extremely well educated in the scriptures. I'm getting a little bit of feedback up here, guys. Um, I just got to be a little bit careful with that. 
Um, he was extremely well trained in the scriptures and very seasoned in them. Uh, the scriptures tell us that he, he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Um, actually, in this, later on, he tells us this in Acts 22. He says this, he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day. Gamaliel was a highly respected rabbi uh, and was a, a, one of the leaders of the Sanhedrin. And so uh, to hear that Paul had been trained as a tent maker, was probably a little confusing to some, but it was very common for all Jewish men to be trained in a trade, even those that were being brought up uh, in, in the law, being brought up as Pharisees, as Paul would later describe himself in his youth. It was very common for them to have a trade, a means for them uh, to support themselves. And so this just happens to be what uh, Paul was trained in, whether it was specifically tents or, or you know, that similar kind of work. But our text here tells us that he was in the same trade. Now, tent making, um, we use that expression still today. It's a common expression used uh, when ministers support themselves financially while doing ministry. And I've got to tell you, there's a time and a place for tent making. I told you that that is the prevailing theme throughout our text here today, that there is a time and a place for all of these things. Now, I have had friends in the ministry that have sort of lamented the idea of tent making. When there is not a ministry role available, they sort of feel as though anything else is kind of below that. They are called to the ministry, and anything aside from that is the wrong path. And uh, I've just got to say, when we look at this, I think what Paul is doing here is recognizing that there's a time, there's sort of an ebb and flow, if you will, to all things. I know my time in, in tent making in my life, I learned things that God would later use in my ministry. And had I overlooked my tent making years, I would have missed out on what he was preparing me for. And in the same way, you know, you may not have the same roles, but we are all a priesthood in Christ. Amen. We need, to, we need to remember that. There is a time and a place for your ministry. There are no bystanders. No one sits the bench on God's team. So there is a time and a place, and God is going to use your tent making for your ministry. He is equipping you to the ministry that he is sending you into. And there is a time and a place for both. Let's continue on. Let's take a look at verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the, that the Christ was Jesus. I want to stop right there. We saw in verse 4 that Paul was reasoning uh, with the, in the synagogues, and he was doing so on the Sabbath. And so Paul was kind of working through the week and coming on Saturday and trying to do his ministry there. There's a word here that I want us to really kind of focus on. Now, I typically read from the ESV when I'm preaching, and I think for the most part the ESV does a fantastic job of sort of finding a, a healthy middle ground between the textual literacy and sort of the readability and the understandability of the text. But that said, I don't think any translation is perfect. Now, understand... The Word of God is perfect, right? The translations therein, at times, may not fully convey exactly what the source text means, and we trust that the Spirit gives us that wisdom and understanding to know when there are times in which maybe our words cannot fully contain the full meaning of the text. The word used here that I want to look at here is occupied. Paul was occupied with the Word. Now, in a standard understanding of English, we look at this and we sort of see he was busy, right? He was, he was kind of just busy with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. When you do hermeneutics, it's important that Scripture interprets Scripture. And if there's a word that gives you pause, you look to see where that word is used elsewhere in the Scriptures. And if it is used elsewhere to mean something different repeatedly, there's a pretty good chance 
that this isn't some outlier and that this doesn't simply mean something that perhaps it has been translated to. I want to show you what this word that is used here for occupied is translated as in several other places throughout the New Testament. Matthew 4.24 says oppressed. Luke 4.38 was suffering. Luke 8.37, they were seized. Luke 8.45, surrounded. Luke 12.50, distressed. Luke 19.43, hemmed, as if brought together. Luke 22.63, they were holding Jesus in custody. It means to be bound. Acts 7.57, covering of the ears. Acts 28.8, afflicted, as if in bed, afflicted with fever. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.14, constrained. Philippians uh, 1.23, it says, For I am in a strait betwixt. I mean, it goes on to say other things. But in a strait betwe- between two things, confined between two things. So when we look at this and we see all of these extreme interpretations of this word, to see Paul was occupied with the word does not mean he was simply busy on Saturday. We need to understand what was happening here. Paul was dealing with a great internal struggle. You see, his heart was on fire to preach the word. But he had other things that he had to do. He had his tent making. He was chomping at the bit to preach the gospel. Now, what we see here is Silas and Timothy arrive... You don't see any mention of tents from here on out. Silas and Timothy are actually bringing financial support from Macedonia, which frees Paul up to do the work. But I want to pay attention to what this tells us. Look at the great obedience of Paul. The great restraint of Paul. To see here how he was grieved, how he was chomping at the bit to be preaching the gospel, but knew that the time was not yet right. He did what he could do, but he knew that he had to wait for God's provision. How many times do we barrel on ahead in life, thinking, I can do this. I can make do with what I have. And we fail to wait for God's provision. Now, there are also times in which we err on the other side, in which God has already provided, and we think that that's not enough, and we say, well, I'm going to continue to wait for God to provide more before I step out. That's, that's wrong as well. But what we see here is that Paul, we, we, we know this because it says here, again, he was occupied with the word. He, and when we look at all the other uses of the word, none of them are simply busy. There is a, a tension in those words. Paul was struggling internally with his inability to be preaching because he knew that he had to do something else at that time. He needed to be uh, supporting himself. He needed to be forming relationships. He needed to put in a little bit of the groundwork, till the soil, if you will, and wait for God to provide. In Luke 14, 28, uh, 14, 28 through 31, this is referring to the cost of discipleship, but Luke writes this. He says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? Whether he is enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? We must be sure that we are prepared for the job we are about to take on. Now, that doesn't always mean that we provide for ourselves. That means we wait until God has provided everything that we need, lest we find ourselves moving forward in our own power, in our own capacity, in our own resources, and we find ourselves like this builder who began to build and did not have what he needed to finish and was a subject of mockery and ridicule. We wait for God's provision. He has given us everything that we need to fulfill the mission that he has put us on. Let's continue on. Verse 6, And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. So this, of course, we, we 
verse 5 kind of jumped over what was happening here. Of course, he's talking to uh, the Jews in the synagogue that he was reasoning with. And they opposed him and reviled him. We see this over and over. Everywhere he goes, he seems to get pushed back in the synagogue. And he shakes out his garments. This was a symbolic gesture. Uh, it was just a way of saying, I'm done with this. It's, it's just very much akin to the kicking off of uh, the sandals, uh, the dust off one's sandals, I should say. Um, so a very symbolic gesture of, um, I'm done with this. I mentioned at the very beginning that there is a time and a place for all things. And there is a time that we have to recognize when we are no longer being fruitful for the gospel. We have to recognize sometimes when the soil is not yet ready. I'm not saying we give up on people. But I am saying there is a time in which the soil is not ready to receive the seed that you are throwing on it. And perhaps that time will never come. We never know. Through, through God, of course, all things are possible. Perhaps you're simply not the right messenger at that time. Right? We, we don't know uh, how God is bringing all people to know him. But there is a time and a place in which we have to do the same kind of thing and, and shake out our garments or kick the dust from our sandals and know when it is time to walk away. But here's the kicker. You see, we trust that when we are obedient, when we open our mouths, when we share the word, that the word will not return void. The word tells us this and we believe it. But we have to ask ourselves. We have to be honest with ourselves. And be sure that we can uphold what this passage here says. He says, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. Can we be found innocent in regard to our attempts to minister in our attempts to share the word. Are we blameless? We cannot control how the word is received, but are we blameless in our transmission? Or are we guilty of holding something back? Have we faithfully shared the word of God or have we cut it short for any number of reasons? Whether it be out of fear or hesitation or any number of reasons. Can we be found innocent of our part? Verse 7 continues on, And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justice, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. I love this. It was next door to the synagogue. I'm sure the synagogue loved that. There was a, a ministry that I had the, the pleasure to work with in Florida. They were based out of Jacksonville, and we would go there a couple of times. Uh, we went about once every year to do some, uh, some missions projects, usually with the youth. We brought some adults a couple of times. And they had a church, and right next door to the church, there was a warehouse. And this is a warehouse that they had purchased, and it was a place where they would feed the homeless in the area. And what he would tell us each and every time we came was that over the years, the changing dynamics of the population and the location in which uh, the church was, people were just leaving People were leaving town. The church was shrinking. The church was, in essence, dying. But the warehouse was thriving. You see, the gospel was not reaching people in one building, but was reaching them abundantly in the next one over. You see, sometimes the difference between heaven and hell is a matter of feet. It's amazing how certain things can change. How receptive people might be if we're willing to just move to where they are. We don't always have to go to the ends of the earth. Sometimes we simply have to go a couple of feet to the left or the right. Or in this case, to the house next door. See, God is at work. It's amazing to see what he can do with such a short distance. Verse 8, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Look at this. You have Paul in the synagogue being pushed away, being pushed back. Uh, the text says he was opposed and reviled by those in the synagogue. And then you move him next door. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believes in the Lord. Together with his entire household 
And many of the Corinthians that hear Paul believe and are baptized. I want you to pay attention to that order. That order is important. We see this over and over. Hear, believe, baptize. Romans 10, 14 tells us this. How will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in Him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You see, there is an imperative to speak. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. See, not only are we given the imperative to speak, we're also given what we are to say, what we are to share, what we are to speak. We are to speak the words of Christ. He has given us everything that we need. And we are promised that if we speak it, if we share it, it is heard and is thus believed. And of course, through that belief comes the salvation that happens internally, externally demonstrated through baptism. Verse 9 continues on and says, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in the city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was pre- proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If you It were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews. I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about the words and names of your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. There's a lot going on there, but I want to jump back to the beginning of that section. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. This may come as a surprise to you that Paul was afraid from time to time. You know, we think of a guy like Paul and we think, here's a man who's just charging the gates of hell with a water pistol. Here's a guy that's not afraid of anything. And here we have the Lord saying to Paul, do not be afraid. See, the truth is, we all get scared sometimes. We're all afraid at times. And it's interesting how frightening sharing our faith can be. It should feel so easy. But there was a fear that comes with sharing our faith. And I want to put something out there. If you find it easy... If you find it not frightening at all, I want to suggest that perhaps it's because you might be leaving some parts out. Because you see, when we're honest, when we share the fullness of the gospel, it requires transparency. It requires vulnerability on our part. And that makes us uncomfortable. You see, we like to diminish our sin in the process of sharing the gospel. We do it quite often. We make very little of the sin in our life, thinking, well, let me just get on to the good stuff. Don't get me wrong. Jesus is still the good stuff. But we make very little of our sin. And in skipping over our sin, we deprive God of His glory. The glory that he is due. You see, we we sort of come at it from a perspective of, well, we were already pretty good and God made us better. I've shared this sentiment with you before and I imagine I will probably do so again many times in the years to come. You see, we did not begin good and Christ simply made us better. 
That is depriving God of His glory. That is minimizing the work of the cross. That is giving us credit that we do not deserve. But we don't like talking about that because we are ashamed of who we were and in many cases, who we still are. Because we are still sinners. We are sinners covered by grace for certain. But we are sinners nonetheless and that makes us uncomfortable. I think one of the greatest problems with the church today is we do not have a right understanding of who God is and who we are. You see, we have to recognize that anything good about us is from Him first and foremost. It is from God and God alone. I mean, let's put this in perspective. We were beings formed from the dust of the earth. We were dirt. And despite being made by God, despite being the created thing, we still have the boldness to defy Almighty God. To simply stand there defiantly and sin brazenly. And instead of receiving the immediate wrath and judgment that we were due, God showed us grace. Even when we didn't even know what the word meant, when we didn't even know anything about who he was, God showed us great uh, grace, and God withheld his hand of judgment on us. See, we did nothing, absolutely nothing, to avoid the wrath and to earn his forgiveness. That was God's mercy. We contributed nothing for our atonement. That was the immeasurable grace of Jesus. And even right now, we could do nothing that is right in the eyes of God without the Holy Spirit who sustains us. And in spite of all of this, we have the audacity to deny him the glory that he is due. Knowing that beginning, middle, and end, it was him the whole way who made our salvation possible. And we still have the audacity to deny him the glory he is due and to mock him with our cowardice because we are afraid to tell how, how truly lost we were, how, tru how, how truly blessed we have been, how far he has brought us, the great gap he has covered to save us, the full measure of his grace, we deny him the glory he is due because we are ashamed of who we were. And that's not going to go away. We're always going to be ashamed, and, and rightfully so. But I want to tell you, when I look at this passage, I'm reminded of the simple truth that God is with you. Do not be afraid. God is with you. There is an ebb and flow. There are times in which you are going to need to sort of cool your heels a little bit and be uh, brought up, either you know, sometimes trained up or sometimes just be re-nourished, sort of gassed back up and sent back out into the ministry. There's an ebb and a flow to all things, but God is with you. When it is time to be silent, we remain silent out of obedience. When it's time to speak, we speak boldly. And when I say remain silent out of obedience, I don't mean to any authorities here on this earth. I mean be silent when the Lord tells you to be silent. There is a time and a place for all things. The question is, are we ready to move when God calls us to move? Are we continually waiting for a sign that he has shown us over and over and over again? This morning I had to make a trip and do a prayer at a ceremony. And as I was leaving, I was reminded of those lights that we have at all these on-ramps. Every time you get an I-5, just about every single ramp you take, there's this metering light that sort of gets everyone in there in sort of a nice, easy pattern. And I recognize that as we pull up to it, we are watching intently 
I don't think we've ever been more focused in our entire life as when we're watching, waiting for that thing to turn green. And when it is red, you know what you're supposed to do. You wait. But man, when it turns green, you're on it. There's not one of us here that sees that light turn green and sits there and says, I'm not, that may not be it. I'll wait for the next one. No. That's not quite green enough. I'm not sure. I don't know what to do here. You know what to do. It turns green and you immediately begin to move. What if we were that obedient to the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit? When God says move, we move. But instead we hold back because we're afraid. And it's understandable, I get it. I'm no better than you. I'm afraid too. Can we just be honest with ourselves? There are times in which it's scary. It's easy to talk about the love of Jesus. And certainly that's, uh, that, that's the most important part of the gospel message. is the price that was paid, the love of Christ and the salvation that we have in Him. And so I don't mean to take anything from that at all. But that's the easy part. The hard part is to recognize what we have been saved from. That's the part that we are afraid of. And to that again, do not be afraid. The Lord is with you. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that we go through a, a series of seasons in our life. There are going to be times of great movement. There are going to be times of great action. And Lord, there are going to be times of stillness. And Lord, that inaction is not because, Lord, you are not at work, but Lord, sometimes you are working on the messenger and not on the message. Lord, help us to be faithful, to know that we too need work. Help us to know when it is a time of tent making. Help us to know when there is a time of building up new skills that you will use for your glory in the days to come. Help us to know when perhaps you are still working on the one that we were about to speak to. You are always at work. And Father, we want to be working in, in tune with your, your spirit. Lord, we want to be going uh, where you are, where do you want to simply throw up the sails and go where your holy wind is blowing? And to that end, Lord, we pray for clear direction. We are not all that wise as much as we like to pat ourselves in our, on the back and pride ourselves in our, our knowledge and our intellect. Uh, Lord, we miss the forest for the trees sometimes. And sometimes that light is green as it gets. And we're not quite sure if this is the time. And so, Lord, I pray that you would, once again, in your infinite mercy and your infinite grace, that you would overcome our deficiencies. And where we are timid, where we are unsure, where we are ignorant, Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us boldness, that you would give us the words to say if we would but be obedient and open our mouths and speak that the word may be heard and through it, lives would be changed, that people would come to believe, not because of us, Lord, but because of you. Lord, we just want to be blessed to be a part of the process. Give us strength. And Lord, I pray that as we open our mouths and share the truth of your gospel, Convict our hearts to not deprive you of any bit of glory that you are due. Lord, our entire purpose for being created is to give you glory. And if we deny you that glory, we have rebelled against you in perhaps the greatest way possible. We have stood in defiance to our created purpose. Lord, convict us that we would not so brazenly stand against you, that we would not so brazenly withhold your glory. In everything we say and do, may it be honoring and pleasing to you. And Lord, we just ask these things in the name of Jesus.
Amen. That's what we were made to do, to sing His praises. Every tribe, tongue, and nation will glorify Him. Amen? I want to encourage you as you leave here today, that's your job today, to go and to sing His praises, to bring Him glory, to go out into this world and honor Him with your life. And do not be afraid. Would you join me one time more as we pray? Heavenly Father, again, we just thank You for what You have done here today. Lord, as we leave here today, we pray that You would fill us with Your joy that we may go out into this world, uh, light in the darkness, Lord, pointing the way back to you. And Lord, we know that you are with us, and so we are not afraid. And we thank you for that. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Church family, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And I'll see you next week.